Hello and welcome to another episode of Leaders of Transformation. Today we're going to talk about disruption and we're going to talk about specifically disrupting for good. We have Chris Field here. He actually wrote a book on it called Disrupting for Good and we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some of the ways that he does it and how he's teaching other people how to do it. Chris, welcome to Leaders of Transformation. We're just really excited to have you here today. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Well, and we also want to do a shout out to Luciano from Oscar Hamilton, who is the one that made this happen. I always, if I remember, like to, uh, you know, thank the people that make this possible. So, you know, he introduced us and that's why we're here. I love podcasting because of the amazing people that I get to meet like you, Chris. I mean, man, the things that you've done, let's give the listeners a little bit of a, a taste of that. So one of the most uh, disrupting projects that Chris has worked on is called Mercy Project. We're going to talk about that, the nonprofit that he started to rescue children from human trafficking in Ghana, Africa. Um, I don't, these numbers may be larger now, but the numbers when I was researching you online uh, was 150, rescuing 150 children and returning them to their families and providing them with education and transforming their future, really transforming their future transforming their family's experience, life experience. And so just really incredible stuff. So let's talk about that. Let's, how did you become a disruptor? So, you know, when I was a kid, I was a disruptor, but I wouldn't have said it was uh, disrupting for good back then. My parents probably should have won some sort of award that didn't exist for the number of times they had to endure a parent teacher conference where the word potential was bantied around. Uh, you know, I was, I was always a kid who marched a little bit to the beat of a different drum. I didn't always do things just like everybody else. Uh, but really for me, kind of my disruptive coming out, if you will, was when I was 19 years old, three, three things happened over about a six month period. So I ran my first marathon, completely untrained, uh, 26.2 miles of miserable experience, but I finished and realized just how powerful the human body really is, so much more powerful than we than we even give it credit for. And then I also ran for mayor of my hometown uh, just a couple months later, and I placed third out of five candidates. And then I was hired to direct a camp for inner city kids uh, where I was in charge of about 50 college-aged counselors and 600 inner city youth and so all three of those things happened in a six month period for me and it was completely transformational i mean i realized that the walls that felt like they were made out of concrete around me were actually really made out of paper mache and it really helped me realize like i am what keeps me back you know so many times we hear people say well you can't do that or you shouldn't do that or no one does that and we just think Oh, well, I guess they're right. You know, I have never seen anyone do that. And, and at 19, because those three things happened in such quick succession, and I did have people saying, oh, you can't do that, or you shouldn't do that, or you're not old enough to do that. It was like, all of a sudden, I realized, why not me? You know, like when I see something that's wrong in the world, or I see an opportunity to, to bring good, or, or to bring justice, or to, to be a conduit of mercy, why, if not me, then who? And, and why wouldn't I do that? And, you know, so many times when people say we shouldn't or couldn't do something, what they're really saying is that thing scares me. And so I wouldn't do that. But they're not, they're not really, they don't have the right to say if that should scare us too. And so for me, that was the year I always say that my, my desire to do great things outgrew my fear of failure when I was 19 years old. And so if, if disruption was a stick of dynamite, when I was 19 was when the spark was lit. Wow. I can imagine 19 years old running for mayor and, and the, the reactions. I know just being in business myself at 16, 17 years old and into my early 20s, people would be like, what are you doing having a business? Like, shouldn't you right. be at school or go play with your friends kind of thing? And, and yeah. here I was trying to, uh, I was operating in, a, in an adult world and was not perceived and it took a while. And actually it, it's interesting that you say that because um, about this whole idea of dis I never thought about it as disrupting, I, but I did see that I, I had the choice of either becoming bitter about the reactions I was getting or I was gonna get better. And I thought they don't pay attention to me. So I'm just gonna continue to get better and better and better until finally 
they actually pay attention to what I have to say. And then everything changed from, from and grew from there. The momentum went from there. So, yeah. So what about this mercy project? How did this start for you? And um, just tell us a little bit about the journey. So I was 27 years old and I read a book about child trafficking and we we're about to have our first baby. And we'd actually just recently, I mean, within a few weeks of my reading the book, we found out that we were going to have a little girl and we decided we were going to name her Micah after one of our favorite verses in the Bible, which is from Micah chapter six. And it basically says, what's the most important thing to God? And the, the prophet Micah says, to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God is, is the most important thing. And so we'd been praying over my wife's belly. I mean, every single day we were putting our hands on her belly and, and praying for this little girl that we had yet to meet, just praying that she'd be a woman of justice and mercy. And I read this book about human trafficking going on in Ghana, Africa. And I thought, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to bring a, a, a child into this world and i'm already praying that she'll be a woman of justice and mercy you know what a cruel sort of reality if i'm unwilling as her father to model for her the kind of justice and mercy that i'm going to ask her to live out in her life you know what what kind of what kind of dad or or parent says hey uh you do this thing i was never really good at doing you know that it's just that's a really unfair burden that we often, we put that on our kids and even the younger generations now, you know, we're asking them to fix problems that, that we've created. And so I called the author. I didn't know her. I Googled, found her phone number. I called her and asked her to go to Africa with her. Three months later, I showed up in Africa, went out on the world's largest man-made lake. I started meeting these little boys and girls who'd been trafficked into the fishing industry for as little as 20 US dollars and and was just really heartbroken over the reality and, and juxtaposing that with this little girl we were going to bring into the world and we're putting you know we're painting her room and putting these signs up on the walls and making sure her bedding is just perfect and you know, just the, the the reality of those two contrasts was just couldn't have been more striking and so i came home and i remember just weeping on the couch and saying to my wife we have to do something i mean we can't I can't just keep living my life as though this this wasn't real. And so so we did what I think a lot of middle class Americans would do. We started raising money uh, with the goal of handing that to an organization that was doing work and and letting them fix it basically, you know. And and we had some success at that. We raised about $75,000 in those 9 months, but the other thing that happened, I went back to Ghana two more times in those following 9 months, which made for three times in a year. And I just realized that no organization was really getting at the root causes of this problem, that uh, the root cause really in Ghana was poverty. It was, was soul-crushing, bone-breaking poverty. And both the families who trafficked their children were so poor and desperate that they, they thought at least their children would get some food if they were fishing every day. And the traffickers who owned the children were almost all traffic children themselves. And so they were just doing the only thing they knew how to do and the only thing they'd ever known how to do since they were little boys and girls. And so no one was really getting at that root cause. And so it kind of brought a crossroads. Well, do we just say, well, too bad? You know, we did our best. We did more than most people. We'll just give our $75,000 and move on. Or do we double down, push all our chips to the middle of the table and say, look, we're going for, the, we're going for this thing. And, you know, obviously we did the second of those, of those two. We had no idea what we we're doing. I quit my job as a pastor on September 1st, 2010. We launched Mercy Project. No clue what we were doing. And uh, we've been really fortunate and uh, had a lot of grace. People have been excited about the project. We've worked very, very hard. And we've built something really beautiful and, and redemptive out of, the, out of the messiness. And so, like you said, uh, we've now rescued 170 children reuniting them back into their families. Our, our whole process is very holistic. I won't go in long detail here, but uh, we've won international awards for how innovative our process is. Essentially, uh, we've gone into these fishing communities and created relationships with them, and we teach them a, a better way of fishing. So we teach them how to do aquaculture, cage fishing, instead of using the labor of the children. And by doing so, 
were actually able to increase their income by about 20% per family and we're not using the children. And so then they voluntarily released the children back to their families of origin, which is huge because it means they're not motivated to buy more children. So we're actually really solving the problem forever instead of just solving the problem until the next group comes along. And so our 170 children, we've never had a single child re-trafficked. And that's a testament to our Ghanaian social workers all over the country that just do an incredible job of staying connected with the children. They're all going to school. We, you know, many of the children have never been to a day of school when we rescue them. So they're 10, 12, 14 years old. They don't know the alphabet. They don't know how to write their name. They don't know how to count to 10. So we hire private tutors. We have child sponsors who pay, it's $45 a month to be a child sponsor and actually get connected with a real kid. And we're able to use those funds to do things like hire tutors, pay our social workers. You know, the children, a lot of them are, their families are connected to a local church. And so we'll make sure the local pastor knows, hey, this child's had a difficult childhood. The, the family has struggled some. We'll do micro loans with the families to help them be more stable with their income. So it's just a very holistic process. I mean, I'll say it like this. We basically have chosen the hardest, most expensive way to do our work. And that's because typically it's the hardest, most expensive way that's actually gonna solve problems forever. And we can look all around our country and all around the world and we can see what Band-Aids do and that they cause oftentimes more harm than good, even if the intentions are, are right. And you can read books like Toxic Charity and other books and see that hey, we're not doing people favors uh, when we don't solve problems permanently. And so. So we kind of have the play on words uh, in, in my book, Disrupting for Good. It's disruption that's positive, but it's also disruption that's lasting. It's not a flash in the pan. Uh, it's real transformational solutions that come because we do the hard work to solve real problems in real ways. Wow. I, I love, and you're right, because most of the time when you hear charities, they're usually addressing the band-aid they're dressing the symptom and even and i love that they're doing that and sure. at the same time it, you keep thinking like okay well if the boat's leaking right then why don't we plug the holes in the boat rather than continue right. to get more pails to, yeah. to bail it out so what happens with these kids because obviously poverty so you're helping the fishermen to do what they do and be more profitable right. without the need of having children um, to do the work. But, um, but also the parents that, that, that were in poverty, that that's the reason why they actually sold their kids in the first place. Right. How do you help them to, uh, to be able to, um, to, to change their economic situation? Yeah, so that's the micro loans that I referenced, you know, before is that and we so the come forty five dollars and all that actually helps them. Okay. Exactly. So, you know, essentially, you know, 170 kids, you have a hundred different situations, right? But very commonly, almost the, the vast majority of our families, it's a single mom whose husband has either left her or she's become a widow. And she has more children than she can feed. And she's desperate. I mean, she's just literally cannot feed her own children, which is a, a horrific thing. We can't even imagine that in, in America, you know? I mean, and I don't want to offend any of your uh, listeners, but this was such a, a poignant thing that, that one of our Ghanaians said to me one time. He said, every Ghanaian wants to come to America because in America, even your poor people are fat. And he wasn't trying to be rude, but what he was saying was, if, if, if being poor, you still have enough food to become overweight, that's a kind of poor we don't even know in, in Ghana. When you don't have food in Ghana, you starve. Like, you literally starve. And when, when someone says you're poor in America, but you can gain enough food to be able to actually not just be enough weight, but overweight, you know, he was just, it, it was in his mind, he was saying, that's a different sort of poverty. And that's not, you know, for us, that would be the best case scenario we could ever imagine. So you've got these moms who are just desperate for, for, you know, some survival. I mean, they're just trying to survive. And so they know if they send away one of their kids or two of their children, 
and it allows them to feed their other children that, that, you know, it's terrible, but they're kind of hoping against hope that maybe they're actually doing those children a service. You know, and there was a, a woman, I can't remember her name right now, but this isn't my, this isn't my quote, but she said, no one puts their, no one puts their child in the boat unless the water is safer than the land. And she was talking about refugees, but of course that has always stuck with us because of our work in Ghana. Like to me, that epitomizes the way these mothers feel. No mother puts her child in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. And by safer, we mean might offer more stability, might actually make sure the child has food on their plate every single, every single day. And so, you know, that's how, I would say that story personifies 75% of the stories of families that we engage in Ghana. And then you have other outliers like a father who's become disabled you know, he lost his arm in, an, in, a, in a farming accident, or you have a grandmother who's taking care of her children because the parents bailed and literally left and went to another country. You know, uh, there was another family where the mother and father were both still around, but they had seven children and one of them had special needs, she had Down syndrome. Well, there's no resources for parents with a Down syndrome child in, in Ghana. And I mean, so they're just like, man, how do we even do this? Like she can't go work. So I guess we'll send a couple of our capable children off to work in the hope that it lets us take care of this one better, you know? And, and so that's really what it is. And, and I found this quote that I wanted to read to you. It's Desmond Tutu said, uh, there comes a point where we need to just, we need to stop just pulling people out of the river and we need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in in the first place. And that's really epitomized our work with, with Mercy Project is, when you see a child on a boat, everything within you wants to hurry and do everything you can to rescue that child, of course. And they deserve that. And, you know, we want to honor their life and, and name that travesty that is keeping them enslaved. But there's a reason that child's being trafficked. And there's a reason that trafficker owns them. And there's a reason the parents traffic them in the first place. And if we spend all of our energy just pulling that kid out of the boat and then, say, taking them to an orphanage, well, those parents are going to keep trafficking the next kid and that trafficker is going to just buy another kid. So now we're just going to fill up orphanages, which makes us feel good as middle-class Americans, but it doesn't really actually solve the problem. And so that, that's kind of been our driving, it's kind of been our driving force from the very beginning uh, over the last 10 years with Mercy Project. Oh, I love it. And, and what I was, and thank you for clarifying that because it's not just supporting that child, you're actually supporting the family um, and so they're really sponsoring the family and bringing the family out of, of poverty. Interesting. One of my other guests that I've had on the sh had on the show, Steve Mariotti, was doing this in New York, and he realized he was actually teaching young kids that had been gotten in trouble, and he realized that they have not. They just never learned about money. Not interested in school. They've gotten kicked out of every. You know, they had gotten kicked out of every school in New York State. And some of them were violent and had, um, you know, records and so forth. But when he started teaching them about entrepreneurship, everything changed. They were interested in that because it was relevant to them. Yep. And so as a result of that, he realized how he could help these kids was to teach them how to, to elevate themselves out of poverty. And then he ended up going on and, and like you, building an organization to help them do that and uh, eradicate the property that causes all of the violence and all the other things that are going on. So it is amazing. So you, um, you also have a, you also have like where you work with them, the entrepreneur, you know, the, the entrepreneurship boot mm -hmm. camp, I think it's called. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that aspect of it and how can, how can people, so this is great that you're doing this, but I'm also thinking about it in terms of how can others, get involved and support what you're doing or even get involved in it even as a volunteer like support yeah. with finances but also support with investing their time as well yeah totally so anyone can go to mercyproject.net which is our website we have a beautiful website that really tells the story and gives you know a number of different ways to get involved and, and through that website anybody can send me a message uh to you know if they've got something that doesn't fit within one of the boxes on the on the website if you will and you know the entrepreneurship boot camp was really birthed out of 
the idea that what Ghana really needs is jobs. You know, when you've got poor families, it really it's just walking this problem back even further, right? It's why are these women in danger of trafficking their kids in the first place? Well, it's because they're poor. And why are people poor? It's because they lack education or they lack the education they need to get a good job. Well, so why do they lack jobs? Well, there's not enough jobs for people like them. Like, okay, well, let's help create jobs. And so we just did our first entrepreneurship boot camp in February where we basically took applicants and had around 30 Ghanaians who came to this multi-day boot camp where we basically taught them how to run a business. And the best ones pitched a business idea to us at the end of the, of the week together. And we're funding those entrepreneurs and actually going to give them mentorship and funding with the idea of helping them grow and scale a business to create new jobs. So, you know, typically if you start a business in the U S the goal is to make money and, and any jobs you create out of that are fine, but only as far as they help you make money, right? We don't really reward hey, I have 100 employees, but I've never made any money. It's, we don't really give prizes for that here in the U.S. But in Ghana, that's exactly our goal. We want to make money for the sake of the business being viable, but we don't want to make money at the expense of, or, or sh I should say over and above the goal of creating jobs. So if we had one entrepreneur who could make thousands of dollars for themselves, but they were the only employee, or we had another entrepreneur with an idea that would create 50 jobs and make the same thousands of dollars, we're gonna go with the one that creates the most jobs. And so that's really what we're looking at in, in Ghana. And that's very exciting. I mean, you know, our long-term goals for that, I say long-term, let's call them more medium-term, three to five years, is that this, you know, we'll, we'll gain some success, learn some hard lessons, make some mistakes, do better the second time, the third time, the fourth time, but that in a few years, we would actually have a fund that people would be able to invest in to create these sort of jobs. And they would actually get a return on their investment. Um, and instead of just dropping it in the stock market or putting it into a savings account, uh, that they would actually be able to invest in job creation in a developing country and get a return you know, on their money, almost like a mutual fund portfolio of, of this job creation. So that's what we're doing and, you know, the truth is there's some amazing Ghanaians, intelligent, capable, hardworking. They just need a chance. You know, I mean, they, they lack access to capital in Ghana. If you can even get a business loan, which is very, very difficult, the interest rate is 35%. And you just can't make money on a business when you're paying 30. You know, that's what, a, I mean, that's in a great business. That might be what an owner takes home, but usually not even that, right? An owner might actually make, 10 to 20% depending on the business. And so, you know, if you had to pay back 35%, it's pretty much not even a viable business. And so for us to be able to come in offer these really low interest loans and to be able to work alongside of them to help them solve problems, to help them think critically. They don't really learn critical thinking in school. So much of the, so much of the school is rote memorization and they have 40, 50, 70, 100 kids in a classroom with one teacher. You know, so for us just to be able to teach critical thinking, problem solving, what would you do if this happened? What are five, five options of problem solving? You know, it just, it's like a light comes on. And so it's been really fun for us. And obviously COVID happened right around the time we launched that project. And, you know, that, that affected things in Ghana as well. So uh, we're just now starting to get some momentum back from that and really excited to see where that goes in the next couple of years. Awesome. So when we talk about disrupting and there are people out there that are listening. I know I'm curious about this as well is okay. How do you get started with something like this? And you say, okay, I see a need. Okay. You know, yeah. Figure it out, figure it out along the way. Sure. We can do that. Sure. We can also learn from people that have gone before us and follow in their footsteps. So when you decided that you were going to do this, you quit your job as a pastor, you put everything into this, got obviously got a green agreement from your wife that this is what you both were going to be doing. Right. And then you had to gain some traction. You had to gain some support. Talk just briefly about what that process looked like, just to give people sort of a visual of 
of what they can expect if they're going to embark on something like this? Yeah. So, you know, my definition of a disruptor that I have in my book, Disrupting for Good, is a disruptor is someone who's uncomfortable with the truth. So they show up and take action and persist until a new truth is born. And I think every single one of us, every person listening to this podcast is absolutely has some truth in their life that makes them uncomfortable. So whether it's something in their family, something in their marriage, something in their parenting, something with their health, with their job, with their community, we all have things that we don't like and make us uncomfortable. But most of us, we either just say, well, that's just the way things are, or we wait for somebody else to come along and fix it. We feel like we're, we're incapable. And so I think the first thing is for us to realize we're fully capable of solving the problem and to, to ask ourselves the question, if not me, then who? You know, what, what am I waiting on? What, what is the magic thing that I think is going to happen that's, that's going to change this, this thing from happening? Because if it's still happening by the time you see it, it probably means a bunch of other people have passed on trying to solve that problem as well. So if we really care about it and we honestly want, want to create some sort of change, then we need to step into that gap and, and we need to do it. And, you know, I, I told you before we start recording that I had just written a, a second book that will, will come out in February of 2021. And it's a book on courage, compassion, and creativity. And I talk extensively in that book about courage and, and so much of courage is actually just being willing to show up and it's being willing to show up even when we don't know the outcome. It's being willing to show up even when we aren't sure what's going to happen next. Uh, I have six chapters and one of the chapters is called courage is failing and getting back up again. And, and that is really when we choose to be disruptive, we have to understand that we're probably going to fail and we have to stop being so afraid of failing. Uh, we have to stop worrying so much about what other people think about us, stop letting our lives be defined by other people's terms and, and on other people's terms. And, and knowing that at the end of, the, end of our lives, we're going to be laying in a bed somewhere, we're going to be sitting in a lazy boy, or we're going to be in a rocking chair on a front porch. And we're going to have to be fully accountable for the choices we made in our lives. So nobody else has to come sit in those chairs next to us and we get to decide as a group, like, hey, sh should we have done that thing? It's like, at the end of the day, it's, it's on us. When I saw a problem, how did I respond? When I saw something that needed to be done, did I post on Facebook, fire off a tweet, and then go on with my life and, and, and feel like I had done something about it? Or did I crawl into the pit? Did I crawl into the ditch? And did I sit with people in their pain and in their misery and in their struggle and did I sit with them long enough to hear them and to see them and to be fully present with them? And then did I give my life to something that really mattered? And, you know, this doesn't just have to be about, I think sometimes people get intimidated when they hear about Ghana and they're like, man, that's so far. Like there's people in your neighborhood, kids in your neighborhood, they go to a school where they don't even have books and where those teachers are overworked and underpaid and they don't have the resources they do. And there's people who will listen to this that, that work at consulting companies that solve problems for million dollar clients that we could take those same exact solutions into inner city schools and apply them for retention and parent child engagement and you know police departments engaging the communities of of people of color i mean we have so many solutions in the world what we need is people who are creative and resourceful and persistent enough to take solutions that already exist into places that aren't fully leveraging them yet. And really what we need is vehicles, people who will use their lives as vehicles to help us take what we already know exists and works into places where they have that same sort of challenge. And so don't get intimidated. I think my best advice is don't get intimidated. Start with something small. Maybe it's around your parenting or maybe it's around your, your relationship with your partner or your spouse. You know, maybe it's something in, in your own neighborhood that you don't like that makes you uncomfortable. I don't know what that thing is for you, but I know we all have those. And so we just have to have the courage to show up and, and then to be willing to try to be creative in the way we look to solve the problem. And I'm convinced the vast majority of people in our country are desperate for leadership. 
And wherever you stand on politics aside, we have a real challenge in our country where we're devoid of good leaders and feels more and more and more like people are holding their noses and voting against someone instead of for someone. And it doesn't need to be that way. This country is desperate for good leaders. And that is people who talk less and do more, people who back up their actions with their lives, and people who will give their lives to something bigger than themselves. And, and when people see that kind of leadership, they're so hungry for it that they will run through a brick wall for those kind of leaders. And they will go wherever that person says, hey, this is where we're going. People are gonna line up and they're gonna go there because they are hungry for authenticity. They're hungry for purpose. They're hungry for meaningfulness. And so I don't think we have a, I don't think we have a lack of problems that need to be solved. I don't think we have a lack of people who are able to solve those problems. I think we have a lack of people being willing to stand up and say, hey, I'm the one. I'll solve this problem. And when we get the courage to do that, to stand up and say, hey, here's a vision for where we're going. Who's with me? We're going to have so many people try to get in the boat with us. So we're going to have to get two or three or four different boats. And, and that's a good problem. Wow, Chris. I, I think that's a great place to end and on an exclamation point and yes, yes, and yes to all of that. I love it. I love it. That's what the Leaders of Transformation is about. It's, it's interesting because I've had people that have come and said, hey, I want to be on your show. and I want to talk about what I'm planning to do. And I say, that's fantastic. Go do it. Come back to me and tell, and then we can talk that's about right. what you actually did. And so it's yep. really important because you get that life experience. And it's also about leaders taking, you know, they're being active, actively creating transformation in the world. And so I just, I believe like you, there's just, there's more than enough people and there's more than enough solutions. We just got to get to it. So I love that. Thank, Thank you for you. being here for our listeners. Yes. I encourage you go to meetchrisfield.com, get a copy of his book, Disrupting for Good. Also his new book is coming out. Chris mentioned it is going to come out next year in February. So you can get on his list and be advised when that's coming out. Highly recommend you check out what they're doing at the mercy uh, net. And so we'll make sure all these links are in the show notes. So you're going to have access to Chris, but follow what they're doing, support what they're doing. And like Chris said, you know, I believe leaders of transformation, take action, decide like, and choose you already have the thing in your life that you're uncomfortable with that you don't like that needs to be, that gets to be solved. So why not take action and decide that you're going to get, you're going to get started. And you know what? Interesting thing is, is when you, when somebody steps up and demonstrates leadership, there are people oftentimes that will come around and like Chris pointed out is that they're going to come around you and they're going to support it and they're going to want to get involved. And so you're not going to be alone, but even if you are alone for a little while, it's still worth it to do it. Absolutely. So we encourage you to do that. We look forward to hearing your stories. You can follow us on social. Of course, you can find us through our website as well, leadersoftransformation.com. And we'd love to hear your stories, love to hear how you're making an impact in the world. And also, if you, if you feel inspired by this and you feel like there might be some other people that you know that could be inspired by hearing this, maybe they were saying, oh, I want to do something, but I'm not sure what to do, then share this episode with them so that they can be inspired by Chris's message and get out there and take action. And maybe the two of you or however many there are can get together and do something awesome together. So we encourage you that. We look forward to hearing your stories and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Leaders of Transformation real soon.